Thank you. Um, it's a rather controversial uh, issue, of course, the uh, organ sparing strategy. And as you can see here, most of the patients still require the major surgery, TME surgery, uh, either sphincter saving or not. But as you can see here, in the very early rectal cancer, probably there is a uh, place for local excision. And then you have those patients, either early or more advanced cancers, that show like having a complete uh, clinical response, and that's the place where we try to, to look into whether we can do a wait and see program and organ sparing again. Why do we focus so much on that? And everyone has to agree that although we do minimally invasive surgery, there is morbidity and mortality linked to TME surgery. We still struggle with um, performing a decent anastomosis, and in not all of our patients, even when we try to preserve the sphincter, we do have a good functional outcome. And still today, the permanent colostomy rate is about 20 to 25 percent of the patients. So the question is then, what is the exact role of local excision in early rectal cancer? And in, as you can see today, we do have stable platforms. We can use our routine laparoscopic instruments. We can make a decent local excision within the rectum. But then, as you know, as soon as you've got like, somewhat deeper invasion in the submucosa, you have an increased, a significant increased risk of having positive nodes. And that's, of course, the limitation of uh, the local excision. And again, when you have poor differentiation and lymphovascular invasion, this gradually adds up the risk for lymph node metastasis. And of course, we in some way can predict and you can use like a nomogram to see what the risk is for that patient. But the problem, the main problem is that the risk stratification comes after the local excision. And although you have some expert centers who really can look into detail how deep the, the local infiltration is, when you look to the, the whole community, you see we, we, in one in five patients, we understage the UT1 patients. And then you run into trouble. But of course, in the PT1, you can see even with adverse, you see that there is a, an increased risk for local recurrence. And there is not at all a place for PT2 tumors to leave it like that. The rescue in those patients is to do radical surgery and to do TME surgery. Of course, when you, you're faced with a T1 and PT1, then you are in a gray area. And that's the really you have to, to take into account the, the implementation of radical surgery and the risk factors of your patient. And probably in a high-risk patient, whatever that means, follow-up is the better approach after you, you did a local excision than propose then a radical surgery. So that's the first subset of, of uh, approaches to organ preservation. Another issue is that you see a profound, you can see in a subgroup of patients, a profound effect of near adjuvant chemoradiotherapy. Not only you see a reduction in the size of the tumor, reduction in depth of penetration, but you can see also nodal sterilization, and on top of that, patho pathological complete response. And I will focus on that subgroup of patients. Here, when you look to those uh, pool data, you see that the prevalence is there of CT2 who had got chemo rat, but then you see that you can obtain in one in three of those patients a pathological complete response. And then, of course, then the, the TME surgery is too much surgery. And on top of that, those patients have a very good disease-free survival. So the question is then, can we avoid radical surgery in the good responders? And that's a, a very critical issue, and that leads us to the concept of sustained clinical complete response. And it all started with the Abragama data coming from Sao Paulo, where they looked, and first of all, they stratified a little bit later than we usually do. So normally, we, we operated on patients on week six. They stratified at week 10. They did local excision in a subgroup of patients. And they waited and, and, and looked 
uh, to the patients in, a, in about one-fourth of their patients. And at one year, they call the patient a sustained clinical complete response. But there are some, some questions, some difficulties, some unclarity still there. And one of those issues is the timing of response assessment. How do we assess that? What is the early and late failure rate? And the late we do not know. And how should we optimize the adjuvant treatment treatment if we could, would go in that strategy? And as you all know, and it starts also with the volume of the initial tumor, that the radiation-induced necrosis is time-dependent. And when you look, and these are observational data, you can see that you have a, like an exponential curve of the chance of finding a, a complete pathological response until week 12. So the question is there whether it isn't sensible to rather to restage the patient on week six to, to, to expose that, to, to enlarge the interval and look at week 12. However, the question is whether this benefits every patient, because in, in this, you can see on, on, on a PET study that you already get, in a subgroup of patients, repopulation of the tumor within week six. So the question is still open, and there are some uh, prospective randomized trials on their way. Then the second issue is, how do we assess, how do we assess a complete clinical response? And of course you can say, if I don't feel the tumor anymore, and I see like a specific scar, that will be a complete clinical response. But of course you have a huge inter-observer variability there. And when you look to those uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, data here, although the clinical uh, issue is a predictive factor, they found residual foci of tumor um, in a lot of patients who they assumed to have a clinical complete response. So there we, we, we need to have some adjunct uh, to go forward. And so that brings us to the more actual uh, way of assessing response, the multimodal assessment of response. And Gina hasn't addressed it, and so I, I just briefly say we today at MRI and, and diffusion-weighted MRI to look whether we still have uh, active tumor there or rather fibrosis. And then, of course, you can add some biopsies if needed. And although the, the accuracy of MRI to judge on YPT0 is not that good, it's important that you add up all elements. And as you see here, if you add up the clinical elements you have seen and you add up the MRI findings, the positive post-test probability is 98%. So indeed, if you would operate on those patients, probably only in 2% you would find tumor. So it gives a, a little bit more support um, and strengthen to your uh, uh, assessment. Uh, and of course, the most important thing is there that you don't look at one time point, but you, that you look at different intervals. And progressively, you get the more and more um, data that indeed your patient has a complete clinical uh, response there. And of course, from the beginning on, you see here a clear example of an incomplete response that patients need radical surgery. But the issue is more difficult than that. As you can see here, pre chemo rat, and this is past. What are you doing now? And even you have a small signal there. So that patient clearly has some minimal residual disease. And that questions now the whole issue. Should I embark on a radical surgery on that patient, even if he could lose his sphincter, or will end up with, with bad function, or is that still a candidate for a local approach? And biopsy don't help you that much, because the negative pred uh, predictive value is very few. And the reason is that you only have, when you take a punch biopsy, you don't get the full picture there or whether there is still a, a, a tumor in the deeper layers. So then you can argue and say, okay, then you do a full thickness excision there. That could be a way to go. The problem is that after the adjuvant chemo rat, you see an increase of wound dehiscences and also suffering of the patient, and it's not without any risk there. Another issue is, if you don't see any tumor left, uh, 
what is the risk of residual uh, nodes because you leave them behind? So the, the background risk seems to be about 5 to 7%. Once you still got YPT1, it increases again to 10, 12%, and then it goes up. So, and again, it's not a one-stage issue. If you see like that, preoperative uh, chemo rat, you see there is a, a lymph node there. You cannot say whether it's a, a positive or negative. Post-chemo rat it seems to have uh, diminished a little bit, and your patient has a, a complete clinical response. But then in follow-up, at nine months, it becomes irregular, and then at 12 months, it becomes completely clear that the patient got a positive node, and you do the radical resection. So rather than a one-moment staging and assessment, it's the continuity that's very important. The question is then, what is the basic risk we take? What is the rate of regrowth in those patients that we judge as having a complete clinical response. And that's difficult when you look to literature. And also, how can we improve on that? Could we increase the radiation dose? What do we with the prolonged interval? And there are a lot of ways to go. This is from the, the Abragama group where they, they added some radiotherapy. They, they went from 50 to 54 grays and then added some um, chemotherapy in the interval. Again, they treat other kind of tumors, as you can see, they are small size tumors, but they obtain the sustained clinical response in, in about 65% of their patients. Interesting data here, phase two trial coming from Memorial. As you can see, by, by adding for FOX after the, the, the classical scheme, you see an increase in YPT0 and 0. And in very interesting there, from the surgical perspective, that they haven't seen any increased morbidity or difficulties in the delayed TME group. So that's also a very important factor. Come back to some observational studies here. In the, the Danish group, they, they gave 60 grays in, 40, in uh, 51 patients. As you can see, they, they had a, a complete clinical response in up to 78%. But the problem is that you see here, within two years, you see a regrowth in about 24, 25, 28%. They all could be salvaged, which is an important message there. Majority had endoluminal recurrence. And again, just recent data coming from the Manchester group, where they combined prospective data and registry data, just the same picture, and probably that's going to be what we will end up. Even if you see a complete clinical response, you will find a regrowth in about one-fourth of the patients. And there, of course, we cannot miss that regrowth. We should sit on that patient and then do the radical surgery. Luckily, most of the patients do an endoluminal. Here you can see uh, like a perfect scar, you don't see anything at two months, then the scar becomes like a little bit irregular. And progressively, the clinical picture and the radiological picture match, and of course the patient has a relapse or a regrowth. So you really need to have a stringent and prolonged follow-up. And I guess with those patients, we clearly should look also at very long follow-up up till 10 years there. The major advantage from those, when you look to the Manchester data, the colostomy-free survival is higher, of course, in those patients who had the wait and see, but the both groups are not completely comparable. But when you look to the non-regrowth disease-free survival, they are equal as well as the overall survival. What we do not know is what the functional consequences are of radiochemotherapy, and when you add up the dose, and when you add up chemo, and here at least you can see in a small study that you also can see fractionated stools in those patients who haven't got the resection. So this could be like the algorithm how you, you can proceed. You see a clinical complete response, you don't feel at ease, you still can do a TAM or transanal excision. The minor tumor you find, you go for the radical surgery. If you say, I'm, I feel at ease, then you follow the patient, you look for that early regrowth, 
which will happen in one in three of your patients within the first two years. And then, of course, you keep them in follow-up to see, to find the late failures. So we still struggle a bit. We still are, there is a lack of clarity to define complete uh, uh, clinical response. You know that the problem of early regrowth and certainly we don't have uh, uh, a lot of long-term efficacy data. So although it's appealing, um, it's not an accepted paradigm yet, but there is a lot of intention there. And also you, you have seen we, sh we, we should determine the optimal neoadjuvant therapy. And one of the big problems of, of course, we don't have a predictor who's going to respond and who's not. And so you will overtreat again patients just by aiming at wait and see. I thank you.